good afternoon, teacher. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes. yes. So, <clears throat> we, of course, are here to talk about communication. And we do have a few, a few ground rules. And the first one, of course, is that we have to use our cameras. So you, in order to participate in this class, will need to turn on your cameras. So let's give it a try. And I will make my screen a little bit bigger so I can see everyone. <sighs> so. Um, can I have some more, please? Yes, please go ahead. Who is this? Uh, please introduce yourself and go right ahead. Um, yeah, um, no, I'm being diagnosed with COVID-19, with, with COVID so I look terrible right now. So can I not turn on the camera? Thank you. Um, no, wait, 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 wait. Hello? Yeah, I'm here. Um, first of all, what's your name? Uh, my name is Ming. Quang Ming. Your name, your name is Ming? Yeah, yeah. Okay, Ming, uh, turn on your camera. Uh, no, as I said before, I am now being diagnosed with COVID-19. Um, no one is here to judge you. No one cares no, what it looks like. Yeah, but mm, I'm really tired. So... so. Well, that's a bummer. That's such a down way to start. I really hope you feel better. I really hope you feel better. I wish you well, okay? It's unfortunate I won't get to see you because of course we are here to study communication. And as you can see, one of the ways we communicate is through body language. And even if we are restricted to digital communication, we know that it becomes very important to show our faces, to show our faces, okay? And we also know that it's important to represent ourselves in a positive way. So I want us to spend the few hours that we have over the next few weeks together to each time that we get the opportunity to be together, that we both take the chance to represent ourselves, let ourselves be heard and seen so that we can understand and be understood, okay? So no one cares what anyone here looks like. I know that you guys will be fixing your hair and you're used to taking selfies. Don't worry about it. We're not here to judge. All right, so do we have a class monitor, first of all? Yes. Who's the class monitor? Uh, I'm here. All right, please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself. <laughs> uh, yeah, my, my name is uh, Vanang and uh, I'm on to, uh, my class. And uh, okay. uh, yeah, uh, I think... Uh, I'm uh, kite recording in progress, and uh, I can. I always smile well before everything when I face everything. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So you, as a way of dealing with everything, you you choose to smile. That's very powerful. Why? <laughs> Why? Hmm. Actually, I don't know. Maybe because of my uh, family, uh, because of uh, everybody I uh, meet and I uh, mm, talk. It's like you when I see you, I feel uh, you have a uh, very good uh, power, <laughs> and uh, uh, maybe I'm happy when uh, study with you. <laughs> oh, I. Me too. I have a good feeling about you all as well. Um, your name is Vinang? Yes, Vinang. 
Okay. And where do you come from? Uh, I'm come. Uh, I'm from Vĩnh Phúc, and uh, it's um, uh, it's a province uh, near Hanoi city. <laughs> okay, it's a province near Hanoi. All right. Yeah. And tell me something interesting about yourself. Um, I like uh, about myself. I mm -hmm. like ah. Uh, uh, now I'm a streamer on Nemo TV, and um, and uh, I uh, talking with the, I like uh, I I really like uh, talking, but uh, in Vietnamese, Vietnamese not uh, English because okay. my uh, English is not uh, good. <laughs> you think and your English is not good? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Sometimes I feel uh, sad because uh, I I feel sad when I speak English. Because uh, maybe uh, I'm scared. Um, I'm scared. Maybe I can uh, speak uh, wrong some words or something. Okay. <laughs> yeah. how, did you, how did you learn to speak Vietnamese? What could you could you speak again? How did you learn to speak Vietnamese? Uh, just talk, just speak first, <laughs> and here, um, wait a minute, which one first? You said speak first and hear, which no, one no. first? I three here first. Aha, yeah. all right, so that's the first thing we know about communication, Yeah, is that the most important thing is that we are wired, even from babies, to learn to communicate. It is the very first thing that we do, right? We learn yes. to move, and then we learn to communicate. And how do we learn to communicate? What is the two steps again? You said it? Um, actually, yeah. speak. Actually, it's like my mic. My mic. Mimic, yes, oh, yeah. yes, and we mimic movement and sound yeah. at the same time. Yeah, right. Do we get it? Do we always get it right the first time? What? Do we get it right the first time? Uh, no. no, actually, no. No, and it's okay. We try again, and we we can make ourselves understood and understand, yeah. Yeah. This is very important. Do you know why? <clears throat> mm, I think uh, when, I, uh, when uh, we're wrong, we can, uh, we, we can know, uh, uh, we can know where we're wrong and uh, make it uh, one more time, uh, one more time, more and more, and uh, we can uh, speak better. Yes. And do everything better. Yes. Before. You can. And guess what? Two things happen when you try again and you try again and the other person tries again and you try again. Guess what happens? You try mm. together. Yeah. You try together and you become attuned. Become you know head Yeah. So I want everyone to try this. Say this, attuned, to be attuned. Can you say that? Attuned. 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 Okay, it comes from the word tune. Like you have a musical instrument, tune. Tune. I'll show you. What's that? Let's try this one. See my instrument? I have to put it down. Yeah. Tune. Okay. Yeah. When people communicate together, they also have the same tune together. You can even see their body language mimic, like you said, mimic each other. 
So sometimes if you watch people talking, one person will sit back and the other person will sit back. And the other person will lean forward and then the next person will lean forward. The other person will fold their arms and the other person will fold their arms. And one person will cross their legs and the other person cross their legs. And this is what we call attunement. And it comes from, as you said, the way that we learn to mimic each other when we talk. So we know everything we need to know about interpersonal communication. Now, I would like to share with you some more things that we have studied about interpersonal communication, all right? So thank you very much uh, for introducing yourself. We will have an opportunity later for more of us to introduce ourselves because again, it is the very first thing we do when we communicate interpersonally is to make ourselves known. Can you see the screen? Yes. All right. All right. So on the next slide, I want to talk about what interpersonal communication looks like in the classroom. And I would like for you to nominate one of your classmates to help talk us through this slide. Okay. Engaged pedagogy. And why is engaged pedagogy an important way to think about the classroom? So nominate one of your classmates to help us quickly talk through what is engaged pedagogy? Engaged pedagogy. And why are we using this to organize our study of communication? So the name. Who's one of your classmates that can help us talk through this, this topic? Yes, hello. Mm, hello. Yes, can you nominate one of your classmates, please? Um, I'm thinking who can. Nominate one of your classmates. To help us unfold engaged pedagogy. Do you know your classmates? Just I know my classmate. Okay. So yes. nominate someone who is from a very different region of Vietnam than you. Who do you know who is from a very different region of Vietnam than you? Anyone? Yes? Someone who comes from a very different place than you come uh, from. Actually, all my, um, I think. Um, Everyone comes from the same region? No, difference. Okay, so tell me someone, name someone who comes from a different region. Um, How about Ling Chi? Okay, Ling Chi. Where does Ling Chi come from? Nghệ An. Ling Chi come from Nghệ An. <laughs> it's very far from uh, my hometown. She comes from where? Nghệ An. Nghệ An. And where is Nghệ An? Mm, Nghệ An is hometown of uh, Ho Chi Minh. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So yeah. does that mean it's in in what region, what province is it in?
Tell me where uh, where central. is it? Central. In central. Central. Yes, I yeah. thought is I I imagined that it is near Hue. Near Hue. Uh, is it north or south of Hue? Um, it's um. Uh, it's south of Hue. South of Hue. Yeah. Is it closer to Da Nang? Is it north um, or south of Da Nang? <laughs> near. Not too close, but no, it's close. It's uh, between uh, Thanh Hoa and uh, Ha Ding. Who is this? Please turn on your camera and introduce yourself. Hi. Hello. Where is it? <laughs> um, it's my room. Uh, and her name is um, between uh, Thanh Hoa and Ha Ding. Uh, and uh, Ha Ding is my hometown. Ha Ding. Yes. Okay. And what is Ha Ding famous for? Um, uh, type. Uh, 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 I think very much from Vũng Áng, Vũng Áng Beach, Vũng Áng Beach. Nice beach for this beach, huh? Yes. So that must mean you It's also have, uh-huh, yes. Huh? Go ahead. You said it also has what? I don't understand. You said it has um, a famous beach. I didn't catch the name of the beach. Yes, Wung An. Wung An. Wung An. Yes. And that must mean you also have nice seafood? Uh, yes. Uh, it's a uh, uh, yeah, favorite with a uh, gói mực. Mực. Do you guys know mực? Like mực chang, squid? And octopus? Yes. It's so squid. Yeah, squid. <laughs> Muk. Uh, uh, it's, uh... We can no longer see you. So I want to ask you to help us talk about communication in the classroom, okay? Because of course the classroom is a training ground, training ground, right? And many of you will spend a lot of your working life communicating even on this very platform, Zoom, I think in the future. Do you agree? So I want to briefly share with you five C's, what I call the five C's of engaged pedagogy. Engaged pedagogy. Do you know what pedagogy means? Probably not. Most people do not know what this word pedagogy means. It means the study of studying. It means how people study. So let's very quickly talk about how people study because remember the very first thing that we said is that even the very first skill we learn in communicating is studying, studying language. We learn our own 
language, our own mother tongue. So there's something very important about that, as I said earlier, because it also impacts how we now teach language. So as you, many of you have learned English, perhaps many of you have learned French or German or Japanese or Korean. I've also learned a second language and a third language. So in school, everyone in my hometown studied Spanish or French. I come from Louisville, Kentucky. That's in the middle of the United States geographically, but culturally it's in the Southern part of the United States. And so we studied Spanish and this gave us exposure to many Romance languages. And so later when I was given a choice, I studied French. And at the time we were transitioning between the old way of teaching language and the new way of teaching language. The old way of teaching language, we call it the banking method, like going to the bank. The teacher gives you knowledge and the student takes it out and remembers it and then repeats it on the exam. So in the old language classes, for example, in French, we would learn verbs, nouns, we would remember everything and write down, but we would never talk. And we would never mirror or mimic our teacher or what we could see or what we heard. And this is so unnatural, as we already said, this is not how any of us ever learn our original mother tongue. So we change and we change the way that we teach language so when I began to study French in university, we would have classes that were engaged, engaged. We would teach in an engaged way, more about conversation. And I found that even my grades improved, but also my confidence and ability to speak French. This thinking influenced how we also approach teaching every other subject now. So I want to introduce to you the idea of engaged pedagogy. And it comes from three central textbooks about teaching. The first one you can see in pink is called Teaching Critical Thinking. It is by a writer and her name is Bell Hooks. She is a teacher, <laughs> a university teacher from the United States. Unfortunately, she recently died. She died in January. Um, there's a picture of her on the first slide. That's her on the left. Um, she happens to also come from my home state, Kentucky. And so she wrote throughout her writing career about culture, about um, different aspects of culture, but also about teaching. And so we have taken these five principles of hers from um, Literally, she's written textbooks about teaching and teaching through what she calls engaged pedagogy. Now, do you recognize the person on the right? Let me see, Mr. Do Kwan, I can see. Do you recognize the person on the right? Um, no, sir. Can you see the picture? It's not very large, I know. Yeah, I, 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 I can, but uh, I don't recognize the person on the right. What can you see about the person? I think there's a, a lot that's communicated in the way the person presents themselves. So tell us about this person that you see on the right. What can you see about this person? He's a very, I don't know, like a decent man or... Uh, dedicated to a more like a peaceful life, yeah. Dedicated to a peaceful life. Like a, a monk or um, something, yeah. Yeah, he's, he looks like a monk, right? He's, uh, <laughs> he looks like a monk. <laughs> 
Why, what, tell me, why does he look, tell me three ways that we can see that this is probably a monk. Uh, from his clothes, he's a... Uh, from his clothes, yeah. Hair. From his hair, he doesn't have any shaved it off. Yeah. And? Facial impression, I guess. Yeah. There's even something about the way that he holds his body. I'm going to try it right now. He has like a tree. It's like a tree, like a solid tree trunk. This man, it's like a solid tree. He stands there. It's amazing. What about the woman, Bell Hooks? She's not standing quite like him. How is she standing? What does she look like? And what does her face say? Uh, I've got to skip it for. <laughs> Let's now this is a good one because again we're reading body language and you and as you said there's something about the man on the right that very clearly says what he is what he stands for peace <laughs> um, who he is he's a monk yes um and we can see as we know bell hooks is not as i told you she's a teacher um so in a sense we know that they are two kinds of teachers right how do you think she feels about him honor stand by him yeah yeah she feels honored to stand by him she feels very honored to stand by him so now what if i tell you that that is her teacher I'd be surprised. <laughs> that is her teacher. And she is my teacher. Not because I was in her classroom, but because I have read and studied and written about her books. I met her. I met her two or three, I met her three or four times and I had very intensive, um, very short but intensive conversations. Once in a book reading in a bookshop because she came to our university bookshop where she used to teach. And once in her living room where I got to meet her because she was still connected to my university when I went to the, the city where she lived for an, an internship unrelated to um, what she was doing. And a third time at a conference that happened in my hometown, because as I mentioned, she's also from my city. And at this conference that I was not invited to, but only because I bumped into her earlier that day at a restaurant and I introduced myself in very much the same way you see her standing here I approached her and I said oh my gosh are you bell hooks and I said oh I love you I love but of course I tried to stay calm and it turns out the people that she was with had invited her to a conference on architecture and it happened to be in my hometown they invited me because they could see the look on my face. And in the talk she gave to the National Conference on Architecture, she spoke about culture and space. And I asked a question about culture and space and gender and space and how different genders, how different spaces are used by different genders. And she gave me the idea for a research project and it became my PhD project. So I eventually did my PhD in an idea that I directly got from her in a conference. Much of the work of the man that you see to her left inspired what she writes about in the classroom. 
The man that you see on the left is a monk. He is from near Hue. Do you know of any famous monks from Hue? Not that I could tell. Any of your classmates? How about you, Mai Nguyen? Let's get you to turn on your microphone, your camera. Mai Nguyen, are you there? Maya. Once oh, again, what's again, what's your name? Oh, uh, I'm not my. Not my. Yes. Oh, sorry, because I'm uh, sick right now. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Yes. I can hear that you're sick. Are you okay to speak with us? Uh, no, because... Uh, uh, I'm really tired. <laughs> okay, please call on one of your classmates to join us on your behalf. Oh, uh, uh, I will call up uh, maybe Hung Zhang. Okay, Hung Zhang, are you there? Yes, hello teacher. Hello, do you have a camera? Can we see you? Yes, yes, I'm here. Hong Zhan, I can't see you. I'm trying to find you. So, do you know of any famous monks from near Hue? Can you speak again? I can't hear you. Please. Do you know of any famous monks from near Hue? Um, no, I think I don't, I don't know any. Did you hear of any famous monks who died recently in December near Hue, outside okay. of Hue? Uh, no, uh, I don't know. Uh, in fact, I didn't have the chance to go to Hue, so... Can you see this book? Yes. Can you see it? Yes, I can see it. Can you see the author's name? Yes. Can you say it? Um, I see it's the, the art of the communicating. Mm. By? Uh, I can't see the by yes I can see the name of the book but I can't see the other uh, I don't know has anyone heard of this person have any of you heard of this person um, is that right Yes. Have you heard of this person? Yes. Mm, he's very famous in Vietnam. What is he famous for? Uh, he uh, has a, a conversation uh, in... Um, <laughs> I don't know how to say <laughs> You've heard of him before? Uh, yes, I heard of him from a magazine in Facebook. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think many people have heard of him. Who else has heard of him? Who can share something that they know about Tiet Nyan Han? Who can share something that they know about Tiet Nyan Han? And you can see the title of the book is of course, very relevant for our subject matter. So what can you share about Kit Nan Han? Who has any knowledge or ideas? And please don't uh, bother to Google just now. Stay with us. Dear Lien, 
Nguyen Julian, are you there? Hello, where did she go? No, dear Lin. Boy, Boy Tian, Boy Ti Hien, are you there? Uh oh, is our connection gone wrong? Hello, Boy Ti Hien, are you there? No. Chan Kuok Kang, are you there? Hmm, seem to have lost everyone. Hang on for a second. Can you guys still hear me? Yes. Antu. Antu, are you there? Hello. Antu, are you there? Okay. Yin Fam. Yes, I'm here. Okay, I was starting to think that I lost everyone to cyberspace. <laughs> okay, um, are you able to um, move your camera so that we can see your face? Yes. All right, thank you. Otherwise, I'm talking to a green dot. <laughs> that is not very nice. <laughs> How are you? I'm very good. Okay. I want to share with you something very important about the basis of our lessons on communication here. And I want to open the door for you to know about a very important um, contributor to how many people in the field of communication and which touches culture, as I spoke about, and emotional intelligence, how this field has been influenced by a single concept called mindfulness. We have studies of communication from neurology as I mentioned, sociology and culture, as I will mention uh, later, um, also from the fields of psychology and emotional intelligence. All of these fields converge on a single idea, mindfulness. The idea of mindfulness came and is referenced in all of these books to a single author. Thich Nhat Han, okay? The man that you see there on the left. I became aware of Thich Nhat Han's work through reading Bell Hooks. Reading her books, um, she explained how his work um, became relevant for, for her own understanding of cross-cultural communication. So I want you to understand that there's a wellspring of ways that you can learn more about communication in very important ways because this author has an incomplete series of books published in English that are not published in Vietnamese. I've searched. This book has not been translated into Vietnamese. You can find it in French, German, 35 other languages. But I challenge you to find this book 
in Vietnamese. So, how does this book relate to our study of communication? As you can see, it did the foundation of what we call the five C's. And what are the five C's? Co-constructed learning, co-constructed, that we construct the classroom together. This means that there are things that I will bring to the classroom, but there's also a portion, a great portion of what we do that is dependent upon what you bring as a student. Okay? Are you still there? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so that's the first thing I want to ask you is um, I mentioned to you, had you heard of Chit Nan Han, but now I want to ask you more about your own experiences in cross-cultural communication. According to the idea, the first idea here of co-constructing the classroom is that we all bring our own cultural and lived experience to the art of communication, that we become more self-aware of our own selves in order to become more aware of others with whom we communicate. So that's the second and third idea together that we get from the art of communicating, what we call um, critical listening and critical speech. In the art of communicating, Thich Nhat Han refers to this as deep listening, deep listening. And we'll have some slides very shortly that studies more deeply, uh, <laughs> no pun intended, um, exactly what Thich Nhat Han has to say about this. The reason why we call it critical listening and critical speech here is because as Thich Nhat Han describes it and as um, Bell Hooks uses it in her work on critical community, on um, criticality in the classroom, is because we want to more consistently apply this word critical in the more neutral way. Very often we think about critical, being critical as being negative, as criticizing, as finding fault, as finding flaw, right? You see that I see your head nodding. I want to ask you, Van An Bui Yeah, I'm here. What does it mean for you if I say criticize, criticize, to criticize? criticize. Yes. Mm. What's that mean to criticize? If I criticize someone or to be critical? It's not good uh, words. It's like uh, you talk, uh, it's, for example, I do something bad and you will say, oh, you are bad, you are blah, 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 blah. Yes. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It, 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 all, it means that we're pointing out what's bad. So we want to, according to these books here, we want to use the idea of critical in the context of critical thinking, right? So we want to not only look for the bad, but also look for the good, look for both sides to have a more holistic view, right? A more realistic view, not just the bad, but also the good. And in order to do that, we have to do something that we started this very conversation with, how we learn. We have to both listen, and speak in that order. But crucially, we have to try to mimic or mirror that person's experience in order that we can understand it. So we really are talking about empathy and we're breaking up the meaning and function of empathy into different components. So you will hear a lot in the readings and writings 
from Bell Hooks, from Thich Nhat Hanh, words like empathy, compassion, and how that can be used as a strength. And so what you see here with the five C's is a way that we think about empathy in action. And so one component of empathy is certainly understanding both the good and the bad, being critical and thinking critically, okay? So those are um, three of the five C's. The other two, caring and comedy, are very important as well when we think about communication. Now let's talk about caring because that's effectively what I just said with empathy and compassion, that we want to understand, that we are invested in trying to understand other people's First, not making ourselves understood, okay? And the last part is when I say comedy. Now, when your class monitor introduced herself, she said one interesting thing about her is that anything that, anything that she faces, she smiles. Here's something that those who have studied emotional intelligence know that's wired into our brains neurologically when they scan our brains with MRI, magnetic resonance, they can see that the physical action of smiling, A, feels good, B, it has an impact on our emotions. Just like when we have a happy idea, we may smile. When we smile, it sparks happy ideas. And the third thing about smiling and of course laughter is that it's contagious. When one person smiles and we see them, we tend to reflectively mimic their smile, just like a baby. We've all seen little toddlers watching, studying our faces, and we smile and we laugh at them and they smile and they, we can see them studying our faces and moving their mouth and their eyes like ours. They're mirroring our faces and they are trying to understand us. And what we're teaching them and what we want to show them is happiness, joy. And so when we communicate, it is very important that we also imagine that there is positivity to the experience and the outcome. That we know that especially when there is disagreement or division or discord, that we have the ability to insert positivity. That we can say, even if we're fighting, I believe that there can be a positive outcome. And I can do this in the way that I communicate by attempting to introduce comedy, irony, for example, finding the silliness. Oftentimes when two people are fighting, at some point they realize that what they're fighting about is really silly, is unimportant, and they start to laugh about it. I dare I say we're in a time where I just faced this yesterday, as you know, um, we're in a time of a global crisis. There is a physical violent war happening now. And so just yesterday, I was in my kitchen with my spouse and we were fussing and fighting over something menial. And then we thought to ourselves, just as we were preparing dinner, wow, how fortunate it is that we have the, the safety, the freedom, the opportunity to just prepare our own dinner. When suddenly um, in Ukraine, for example, Many people who from one day to the next are not able to do this. Irony, right? We're able to laugh at our own problems. And it brings not only humor, but even a good feeling that gives you perspective. These elements of communication, again, are reflected in how we think about the writing of Thich Nhat Han. I understand that many people in Vietnam got to know him as a monk and as a spiritual leader. 
I've lived in Vietnam um, and visited Vietnam uh, very much. And having spoken to many people in Vietnam, I'm very aware that um, his writings in English and about communication and particularly mindfulness are not as well known. And yet um, you're seeing evidence here of how crucial they are to how we think about the modern classroom. Equally, I have a lot of books. <laughs> The other, the, the final book that you see here, I've referenced a great deal of work on psychology and how we think about communication also through the study of the brain, neurologically how the brain is wired, but also through those who study the lived experience through psychology. You interview people, you try to heal people. So, all of these have greatly influenced communication today and the study of communication and crucially how we study communication in the classroom. There's one more element about mindfulness that I want to really make sure we understand before we take any further step. The reason why we're doing this now, why is this so important? Well, let's think about business etiquette. As I said to you, if the idea of mindfulness has impacted, inflected every area of modern ideas about communication, Certainly when you look at leadership, what makes a good leader, it's converging on mindfulness, what makes a mindful leader. And so we'll be taking the idea of how do we think of and see a modern leader and how do we adapt their skills, abilities and emotional intelligence to be a more effective communicator ourselves. But this is even more important now. So, Huang Zhang, are you there? Can you unmute for me? Can you unmute for us, please? Huang Zhang? How are you? I'm great, thank you. Good. Are you able to see the screen clearly? Yes. Yes. What do you see? What's the picture? It's a screenshot from a very famous 90s movie. Can you see the picture? Yes, sir. What do you see? Describe what you see. Uh, I see a robot, um, uh, which uh, were like a human. Yeah. And I think it's... Uh, um, it show like uh, uh, he has the thinking like human. I think so. The yeah. emotion. Yeah. Even he has emotions. Do you think? Do you think robots have emotions? Um. Uh, no, I don't think so. But um, some I think sometimes if uh you if the people can uh can improve the the technology, I think maybe one time. Uh, one day, human uh, robot can be some over control of the human. Okay, and that's the question. If we have humans and we have robots, and more and more robots are getting smarter and smarter, hey, what is the difference? Are robots smarter than humans? Do you think so? Are robots smarter than humans? I don't think so. Uh, because uh, the robot uh, is uh, built by the human. They, they write the code for the robot. So I think all the knowledge uh, of the robot is uh, made from human. 
So I don't think robot is smarter than a human. Okay. I tend to agree with you, but there are some exceptions. There are, for example, some jobs that robots can do that we no longer need humans for. There are several jobs where robots have replaced humans. Do you know? Uh, like in the factory. Yeah, like in the factory. So hang on for a second. I want to brainstorm. I want to brainstorm with your classroom, with your classmates. Let's see how many jobs we can name where robots have already replaced humans. Just what we know. Let's do that. Let's take one minute and let's use the chat function. And let's name as many jobs as we can where robots are replacing humans. So for example, you said factory, but there are many different kinds of factories. And I know that not every kind of factory has robots replacing humans. I mean, there's even food factories and we know that we still have humans in food factories. So I want to use our chat function. Can everyone see the chat area? Hello, everyone. Can you see the chat area? Yes. All right. Can everyone hear me still? Yes. All right. So let's do that. Let's try and brainstorm together what kinds of jobs have already been replaced by technology, robots, artificial intelligence? What are some of those jobs that we know? So let's go. I'm going to time us. We have one minute. I'll put on my timer. I have a watch here. Are you guys ready? Yin Fam, are you ready? No, no. Wait for a minute. Are you using the Google to search for jobs? A little bit. <laughs> okay. But that's not brainstorming. That's Google searching. Um. I just know some jobs that are used by the uh, the people who use AI, the artificial inter intelligence. So, give me an example. Um, like um, uh, um, tellers in in a bank. Okay, describe it. That's a very good example. Tell me how that works. Uh, like um, the customer would. Uh, go to the bank and uh, they don't need to um, do the transaction with the tellers. They could um, use the, um, the AI in, in a computer and they could um, um, do the transaction on computer and, uh, and um, the tellers would be uh, replaced by uh, AI. Yes. Now, everybody, I want you to, right now, get out a credit card, a bank card, a card with a chip. You don't have to show um, the number on the screen, but let's, let's talk about this. This is very serious, this banking one. So go get a card and I'll show you one as well. All righty, so here we go. <laughs> I have to cover my number because um, illegal matters. <laughs> so did you follow your classmates example of how this 
gadget is an example of artificial intelligence and how this artificial intelligence has in many ways replaced jobs. So what is this thing? What is that? It's a chip. Yeah, it's a chip. So I can even use this chip hands-free. I can even use the chip hands-free. And the other aspect is, as you said, what happens when I go to the bank? If I want to do something with my money, I want to get some money. Do I need to talk to a person? No. Uh, want, hmm? Like um, in the time we have uh, the TV bank, is a thing for mine like uh, we use the uh, 24 uh, per 7 a, uh, ATM like it's automatic uh, and it's there automatic, you go yeah money machine so we can uh, we don't need to go to the bank and uh, meet directly the, the teller and we can uh, use that and um, can see them through the, the, the machine and mm -hmm. um or uh, we can use the fingerprint mm -hmm. and the face ID to transaction. Mm -hmm. to do the transaction. At the machine, right there. Yeah. So even, and because I tried it, I know it at BID, do you know BIDV, BIVD Bank? Yes, yes, yes. You can use, even no card, you can use your fingerprint, you can use your phone at the machine, I tried it. I don't need to go inside. I don't need to talk to a person. And you know what? Oh. I can go right now. I can go at 2 a.m., 2 p.m. Actually, it's better than a human. Do you think so? Mm. I think it's more convenient than... Yeah, it's more convenient. Can a human work 24-7? No. <laughs> no. Is the machine hungry? Uh, yes, maybe. <laughs> uh, sometimes yeah. sometimes they have, uh, the, the machine has some trouble, so they have to come there and check the problem. <laughs> yes. Sometimes you have to fill it up. <laughs> the sheet needs more money. Yeah. Sometimes it needs a break. Sometimes it has a problem. But the machine is, do you, does the machine pay taxes? Um, I, I, I don't know, pay attention to this. Um, Tax, I mean, income tax. Maybe. The machine for the money, they don't pay tax, but the person inside working has to pay tax. So there's a different kind of loss. How many jobs do you think one bank machine can replace? How many teller jobs? We don't know, but we can imagine that it is a lot. Okay. I want to ask someone else, what is a different kind of job that you think a robot has replaced? Now I asked you guys to brainstorm within a minute and so certainly, um, certainly now we, you all have had a chance to use the Google. <laughs> so tell me, what are, please write here, what are some other jobs that robots and artificial intelligence have replaced? So certainly your classmate has named uh, one that we see and use all the time. And it is certainly related to other ways that we spend. 
So what are other jobs that have been replaced by robots and artificial intelligence? Hmm? Come on, chat, speak up, raise your hand. Let's hear you. What are jobs that have been replaced by these robots? We know bank teller. There's another kind of teller that you guys are going to see very soon. It's so common here in the West already, but in shops, you can also pay at a automatic machine. So even in the shops, they have a lot of these automatic machines. So what are some other jobs? Feng Ni, are you there? Are you there, Feng um, I don't know. What are some other jobs that have been replaced by artificial intelligence? I, I don't know. Any other? Hmm? Speak up. Maybe she does not want to speak. <laughs> it's okay. Anta. Fung Anta, are you there? Are you here? Yes. Are you also, you're ill. I'm sorry to hear. I can hear that. Yes. Are you able to talk? Do you know of jobs that have been replaced by robots? Uh, sorry, but I... Uh, can you type uh, in the chat area? Okay. Okay. So you guys, um, future-proofing yourselves from artificial intelligence. What are jobs that are already eliminated by artificial intelligence? And there's one staring us in our face. So come on. Um, I think, uh, in my opinion, I think uh, two jobs may be replaced. The first is the transactional, the secondly, security. Okay. Who's this? Uh, I am Hien. Hien. Okay. I'm trying to find your image. Okay. Hien. Do you have a camera? Okay. Oh, I will open right now. All right, so repeat, repeat that again, what you said, two jobs that have been replaced. Um, two jobs may be replaced in the prime. Uh, the first is the transactional. The second is the security. Okay, give me an example so I can understand what you mean. Um, let me think. One of your classmates has written work in a factory, and I'm wondering if you've already become aware of what kinds of factory work that has been what we call automated. That's another word for robot, isn't it? You have a machine that automatically sews, automatically glues, automatically folds, automatically puts together, automatically assembles. So, Bui Ti Hien, there you go. You said security, for example. Yeah. What do you imagine how security will be a function of robots or artificial intelligence? Uh, I think maybe when uh, traffic go to the 
um, Clara maybe uh, maybe only need a card and uh, put in the AI uh, AI transaction. So it we will open and we go go out uh, go con and we we will go. That's right. In fact, we know that we see a great deal of AI in traffic management. Just as you said, when there are barriers, we can identify a vehicle with the camera, yeah. often by the license plate, that's artificial intelligence. We yeah. can see the driver and take a picture. Yeah. And in many places, we can even have facial recognition. So we can even know who is in the vehicle. As you said, we can also pay if we need to pay for the road or pay toll, as we say. And yeah. this is used in many ways for traffic management, right? What happens if you have a camera next to a red light, next to a traffic light? Do you know this? Yeah, I know. Yeah. So it's a very good example because this, we have artificial intelligence already around us. And so if we have more cameras, do you think we have a traffic policeman standing there? Yeah. Sometimes we don't need traffic police, man or woman, standing at the intersection because they have cameras. So even this job of security and traffic enforcement, traffic management, is influenced by artificial intelligence. All right, I want to give you one last example and then I have an activity for you all, an activity, uh, what I call a mindfulness activity. How aware are you are your own, of your own influences on the roots of your communication? Now, here we go. The last one is of course the newest influence on all of our cultures and all of the ways that we communicate. And we saw this demonstrated just now. So I'm going to, I'm going to play charades, all right? I'm going to use my body to show you how I'm going to respond to a question. So a few minutes ago, I asked you a question. I said, let's brainstorm what what jobs have been replaced by artificial intelligence, right? So I looked at you, I said a question, and I waited for an answer. And this is how many, many people responded to my question. What am I doing? Search the information on the internet. Search the information on internet. Yes. Um, where on the internet? Mm. What? 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 What do you want to? I ask? have an. I have. I have an iPhone. So if I search, where do you imagine that I'm? I'm searching. Uh, you said the information related to the question. But where? Using what? What is the tool? Um, Google. Yeah. It's probably Google. Even if I use Siri, it is still yeah. powered by Google. And what is, what is Google? How does Google work? An algorithm. Can someone type this for me, please? Algorithm, the Google algorithm. Google algorithm, who knows how to write algorithm? How do you write algorithm? I'm gonna write it down on, with a pen and paper. Al go 
rhythm. Algorithm. Does anyone know how to write algorithm? There. Thank you very much, Doquan. Algorithm. So this means that Google has a program that they use to give you an answer to my question. This means that in a sense, artificial intelligence is replacing thinking. Artificial intelligence is replacing thinking. When asked a question, even in the classroom, physically, or even face-to-face, -face, many people instinctively reach for their phones. They don't reach for their minds. They reach for their phones instinctively. We're trained to do this because this phone is very powerful. It screams, come get me, ask me, I can help you, and I can hear you anytime, anywhere. So even in the classroom, even in a classroom where we are studying communication, and even when we acknowledge that paying, paying attention is both respectful and important, both for us as individuals, but also for the teacher and to reflect that with each other, we know that many of us are still unable to resist the distraction of the mobile phone. For example, I would say that most of us um, are using our mobile phone to chat and have been doing so all through this classroom session. Most of us don't put our phones on silent and we keep it near us so that we can respond. So we know that we give away our attention to the technology. And the technology is, this is artificial intelligence. Siri and Google, they are that robot you see on the screen. They are that robot you see on the screen. So if I were to say, hey Siri, Madonna. Well, my phone starts to play music and I actually have to stop her because they are always listening. But it's not just that they're powerful, but look at the example here. Even just now, even you, when asked a question that involves your perspective, you gave over your attention to artificial intelligence. You outsourced thinking to artificial intelligence. So now I wanna give you an activity that you can't outsource to artificial intelligence. <laughs> and mindfulness activity, all right? We are going to now um, do an activity that's going to help us reflect a little bit more on our own influences in communication, as I said. And it is also a good time for a break. So I have here a a survey for you all to complete. And when you complete it, we're going to come back and talk about it. And after um, you complete the survey, I want you to have a short break, okay? So class monitor, are you there? I'm here. All right. So how long do you normally have a break for? How long does your break normally? What could you speak? How long do you normally have a break? Fifteen Five to minutes. ten minutes. Huh? 
Five um, to ten minutes. Uh, I think uh, ten to uh, fifteen <laughs> minutes. <laughs> okay. Huh? So, all right. So I'm going to send you a link to an activity. Okay. I'm going to show you a link to an activity about culture and communication. The activity will take you about five minutes, okay? Yes. And after you finish, I want you to take a break, okay? So if I send you the link now and we take a break, that's 15 minutes, right? So that means we will come back at, let's say, are you still there, class monitor? Mm, yeah. All right. So I want you to come back at, let's say, I'll give you a 15-minute break since we came. So come back at 14.40, okay? Yes. So you have to complete this. So see if you can open it. Can you open the link? Yes. Yes. All right. So please complete this. And then remember, you have to click submit at the bottom. And then I will see you at 2.40, okay? Okay. All right. Bye. Bye, teacher.